Hello, I'm James Lindsay, and this is the Coach House Podcast. Today we have Leslie Lowe, who doesn't want us to be afraid of public bathrooms, even during the pandemic. Bathrooms are, you know, they have high touch surfaces. They are typically small spaces with shared air. However, we never ever saw anybody thinking, okay, we have to close down all the elevators. No more elevators. Poet Dominica Martinello reads her favorite coach house poem. Often I edit out like like overly vulnerable moments. And I think that reading obits allowed me to give myself that permission to be a bit more vulnerable in my own work and not to fear that type of risk. And finally, we've assembled a team of translators to look at why literary translation is still around and why it's not done by computers yet. I generally hate my work until draft three, so there's I just couldn't share it with anyone before then. One of the first things to be shut down at the beginning of the pandemic was public bathrooms. But was this an overreaction? We asked Leslie Lowe, author of No Place to Go, How Public Toilets Fail Our Private Needs, to talk about why this was a bad idea and why everyone thinks public bathrooms are gross. Uh, Hi, Leslie. How are you? I am great. How are you? I'm good, thank you. At the beginning of the pandemic, you wrote widely about why it was bad for public health to close public washrooms. Here's a quote even from a piece you wrote for The Walrus. The question now isn't simply when and how our public bathrooms will reopen. It's whether the pandemic will be the tipping point that teaches people the truth about public bathrooms. So here we are, two years on, the bathrooms have reopened, but do you think that the tipping point happened? Have we expanded the conversation? I'm not sure that we have. Toilets are kind of a long game. Like it takes municipalities a long time to make those decisions. It's capital investments, it's committing. And I think it hasn't quite been what I would call the tipping point, but I don't think all hope is lost. Can you explain why it was a mistake to close bathrooms at the beginning of the pandemic? And who are the people who are most affected by this? Right. So so the people who are most affected are people who already had compromised access. So people experiencing homelessness, anybody who, for example, had a job that required them to be out and about in the city that, you know, not a desk job where they had access. People who were still working, who needed bathrooms and those bathrooms were closed. It also affected, you know, people who have otherwise pretty good access, but but they were still affected negatively in their day-to-day lives, like people walking dogs, you know? I interviewed a woman at the beginning of the pandemic who walked her dogs every Sunday on a really long walk, and she would always stop at this community center and use the washroom halfway, and she couldn't do that anymore, so she had to cut her walk short. So I think there's like a thousand little examples of that. Um, the reason we should not have done that is because Bathrooms are, you know, they have high touch surfaces. They are typically small spaces with shared air. However, we never ever saw anybody thinking, okay, we have to close down all the elevators. No more elevators, right? We knew that those were an essential part of living in cities where people needed to go many, many floors up. And we thought, okay, this is a risk we have to manage. Public bathrooms are easily as important or more important than elevators. I was hoping you could take uh, a minute to talk about the stigma of public bathrooms. Why is there resistance to improving this basic human need? Yeah, so I write quite a bit about that that notion of stigma. It's kind of wobbly, it's hard to get at, but I think everybody can understand um, if they read the book or even just in their own experience that the only relationship we generally have with public bathrooms is that they are funny or they're gross. Um, and we're not really taught any other way of interacting with public bathrooms. And so that causes their mere existence to be kind of a joke or something that we don't want to talk about, we don't want to look at. You know, there have been big movements in municipalities when bathrooms were installed in parks to put them in the back of the park. It's like, no, 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 bathrooms, no, put them in the back of the park. Nobody wants to see that. They're dangerous, they're gross. And that caused a lot of problems with the way we have continued to kind of um, have relationships with public bathrooms and for the provision of public bathrooms. 
you wrote uh, the book, so to speak, about public bathrooms, No Place to Go. When you were doing research for your book, um, what did people think about when you were saying you were doing a work on public bathrooms and how they were failing our needs? Did you encounter like there must have been some humor around this or at least confusion on your interviewees end? Yeah, well, I mean, not so much on interviewees because the public bathroom people are like, damn, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, people, we, the, those of us who get it really, really get it. But, you know, when you're at a cocktail party and you tell somebody you're writing a book about public bathrooms, there's only uh, either uncomfortable laughter or backing away very slowly. But I think that just really illustrates that stigma you're asking about and this notion that we don't actually, we, we don't have tools necessarily to even have conversations about this. I would say, you know, I think a lot of cities are are talking about period poverty now and talking about access to menstrual menstrual products as a matter of course in public bathrooms. And I think that's kind of elevated the conversation a bit, but we still have quite a ways to go. Is there anyone getting it right? Was there anyone getting it right before the pandemic? But I'm really interested as well as has anyone made the pivot post pandemic to improve public bathrooms? So pre-pandemic, um, Portland, Oregon is a real standout. So Portland has a proprietary design that its city council um, didn't create, but, but you know put the tools in place to create called the Portland Loo, which is a standalone public bathroom on street, free, um, big enough to bring your bike in. It's got hand washing and potable water on the outside. So a really, really good example of a public bathroom that can put in be put in relatively inexpensively in a municipality and is really important. If you go to Portland, Oregon, which I, I have researching public bathrooms, you see everybody using the Portland Loo. You know, they're at the park. Everybody uses them. There, there's no stigma around those whatsoever. So that's a city that's really done a good job. Um, I, during the pandemic, you know, we saw a lot of municipalities, Victoria, Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, Halifax, put in um, public bathrooms, just like temporary bathrooms outside of public facilities to sort of take the place of the bathrooms that had been closed because of COVID. And I think that was really good. I don't know that a lot of those have become permanent bathrooms. I will say, and this speaks again to that issue of like, the slow grinding wheels of bureaucracy, but Halifax, Nova Scotia, where I live, has a brand new public bathroom in a park. It is, I haven't been inside yet, because it's not, it's not open just yet, but oh, it looks so good. And it's in this park and it's just, you know, it's, it makes me so happy to see it. I have to end up here by asking you about your top public bathrooms. Like you, you, you've been to some public bathrooms, both for research and like most of us just in real world, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what, what are some of your, I'm curious of the greatest hits here. Can you give us some of your greatest hits of public bathrooms from around the world? Um, okay. Number one is Bryant Park in New York. It's in Midtown Manhattan. Um, it's not in any way, you know, this paragon of equity in terms of gender or accessibility, but my God, it's a beautiful old building. I think it was built in 1910. It's run by the Business Improvement District um, in that area, and it serves the park, but it also opens quite early, you know, before people will be at the park. There are attendants in the bathroom, they spend something like 200K a year on f fresh flowers. It's exquisite and free and just open to anybody who needs to use it. Leslie Lowe, thank you for joining us on the Coach House Podcast. Thanks so much. Welcome to the Coach House Poetry Spotlight, where Coach House poets pick Coach House poems to read. Today we have Dominica Martinello. Dominica holds an MFA in poetry from the Iowa Writers Workshop, where she was the recipient of the Dina Davison Freeman Prize for Poetry. She currently lives in Montreal. She's the author of All Day I Dream About Sirens, which was released by Coach House in 2019. Okay, hey, Dominica, thank you for joining us. How are you? 
I'm great. This is my pleasure. I'm so happy that Coach House is doing a podcast. It's really exciting. And we're happy to have you on the podcast. It's our <laughs> first poet, too. Um, can you tell us a bit about the poem you brought to talk about and read today? Yes. So the poem I brought to talk about is called Obit. Um, and it is from Tess Liam's collection, Obits. Um, this, the, the book has a few obit poems that come throughout, they're sprinkled throughout the collection, but this one caught my attention uh, when I first read the book, and it, it's one I've returned to um, many times. I love the collection as a whole, but this one in particular I've returned to. I really like it because it sort of has a different tone than you would expect uh, for a poem that is sort of modeled on an obit, and that is about grief and mourning. Um, so the tone is really unique, and I just love the way that the form and content are in conversation uh, with each other. Okay. Well, without further ado, do you want to read Obit for us? Yes, I'd love to. Obit. A distance, and I am allowed long lapses of remembering. Days without thinking. Loss. She is a place I am allowed to visit. I am allowed distance. I am a loud distance. Bodies too close together are loud too. Two people spooning next to the busker between the escalator and the platform this morning. Most days we are together like a riddle. What stands still while it moves? I'm tired of being touched by everyone. I'm tired of death. On the metro, we keep to ourselves. I read strangers' texts, a conversation consisting of only red heart emojis. Fold our arms against our ribs. We haven't a physical distance between us. I don't tell any rush hour about the 14-hour flight I wasn't asked to take to mourn my last distant aunt. I don't have to tell anyone anything. Thank you very much. So why this particular obit? Like there are several poems called obit through this. Um, I know this one you liked especially, but what what do you think the poems all titled obit, just O-B-I-T, what do you, what relation do you think they have? And how do you feel about the use of repetition of title like that in the connect, in the collection? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, I love some good repetition. I love that it echoes throughout and sort of creates these um, moments to land on and to come back to and to view as these singular pieces, but also they kind of accumulate throughout the book, which I really like. Um, What stood out about this obit was just the sense of permissiveness with the repetition of I'm allowed. Um, throughout the poem, which I really liked. And that final couplet, I don't have to tell anyone anything, is just, I think, so iconic. And that was really a memorable ending to, to this one for me. Um, because of course, this, this whole book is about um, grief and mourning and sort of the, the center justified form is so cool. It's, it's kind of like, you know, a newspaper obit um, to me is kind of what I get from that. And, you know, there's a lot of disclosures in these poems, but this I don't have to tell anyone anything is a bit rebellious. It it makes you question, you know, what information are we allowed to get versus what is being held back? And I think that creates a cool tension. Um, So in that way, this one sort of recasts the other ones in a sense. There's something that's being held back and there is an agency. I don't have to tell you the whole story. Um... Or I can tell, I could release the details that I want to be released. And in a way, that is like an obituary. You know, you get certain curated details about someone's life. So there's a sense of choice and agency in in what goes into that kind of portrayal. So in such a subtle way, I feel like this poem brings in all of those things um, with a really breezy tone. Do you think that the poems like did you have to struggle to pick an individual poem from this collection and I ask because everything like this is one of those books where everything seems to work together yeah to a large goal almost like it was a long (laughs) poem or something like that right yeah I felt like this poem in particular can be kind of pulled out of the book and read on its own and still have a lot of power um 
Whereas, yeah, a lot of these pieces fit together in such a way that it almost feels like you're doing an injustice to, to pull one out um, in a sense. Or there's some longer sequences as well that don't lend themselves necessarily to being spoken about on like a, a podcast in, in this way. Uh, so yeah, this one was one of my favorites, but also it really stood alone as its own poem. Even the, the center justified nature of the entire book. I, when the first time I read it, read it, I found it a little shocking because you don't really get that a lot in modern poetry. <laughs> in fact, I, I was sort of like dissuaded from that by certain teachers, you yeah, know? Like, uh, yes. <laughs> what I really like about the form and the content is that um, because it's center justified, there are these caesuras or these like spaces in between the lines that create like a distance on the page between you know, a f one phrase and then another phrase on the same line. And I think that is just so masterfully referencing the distance that's being worked through in the poem, talking about, you know, what does it mean to grieve or mourn someone who is uh, geographically at a far away distance from you, or even just in time, like, let's say that, um, that death happened, you know, far back in time, and now we're at a future point, and there's this space, how does the grieving process change? So in a, in a poem that's dealing with those types of proximities, the fact that we have these, you know, center justified poems creates this rift between the phrases, it really is a nice touch. I, I think that it's a great example of how the form of the poem is really complementing the ideas that are at play. How do you think this has influenced your work? Has it influenced your work? Is there anything you've taken away from this collection that you think you can see in your own work now? That's an interesting question. So yeah, I think so. Um, there's a lot of different formal experimentation. You know, there, there is some regularity in the sense that, yeah, most of the poems are center justified and they're riffing on obits from the newspaper, but there are a lot of different formal tactics that are adopted and I think that that flexibility um, and versatility is really admirable but there is a lot of vulnerability and disclosure and I think that that takes a lot of guts and I find it really risky to be so uh, vulnerable in my work and often I edit out like like overly vulnerable moments and I think that reading obits allowed me to give myself that permission to be a bit more vulnerable in my own work and not to fear that type of risk. That's amazing. Dominica Martinello, thank you so much for being our first poet break guest on the Coach House <laughs> podcast, Poetry Break. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Why can't computers just take over the art of literary translation? We asked three of our translators, Rhonda Mullins. I'm Rhonda Mullins. I'm a French to English literary translator based in Montreal. Pablo Strauss. I'm Pablo Strauss. I translate from French into English. I grew up in Victoria, BC, but I've lived in Quebec City now for around 15 years. Saskia Vogel. Hi there, my name is Saskia Vogel. I'm a novelist and Swedish translator from Los Angeles. I'm living in Berlin now, but in the fall, I'll be heading to Princeton University um, to spend a semester there as their translator in residence. And one of the best booksellers in Toronto, Claire Foster. My name is Claire Foster, and I am a literary translator from French. I live in Toronto, where I also work as a bookseller at Type Books. In my translation of Pierre Clementi's 1973 prison journals, a few personal messages is forthcoming from Small Press. The first question I wanted to ask all of you is um, how many drafts do you tend to go through um, when working through a translation? And crucially, when is the moment that you decide it's time to stop? Well, I tend to go through three drafts before I'm comfortable sending it to an editor. So my first draft, draft is very, very quick and I do very little research. Uh, and then the second draft is where I start, you know, doing a bit more research, um, asking questions of myself and, and eventually the author. But I really can't, I generally hate my work until draft three. So there's, I just couldn't share it with anyone before then. 
Um, and then by the by the time we're done working with the, the publishing house, there are many, many more drafts. But I'd say it's nobody's going to see it until draft three. And how I know when to stop is generally when a publisher tells me to, uh, usually very, very diplomatically. And also I notice that I'll start switching things back and forth, uh, sort of just toggling a certain language. And when I get to that point, I know it's just, you know, I, my brain is just turning in circles and time to stop. Yeah, I, I call that moment um, pushing the, rearranging the furniture. Because like once I start like putting the plant on the side table, but putting the plant on the coffee table, yeah, that's also that's also a good moment, like when I notice it's time to stop. But before then, I have to echo everything um, uh, about about the drafts. The first quick draft, the second one is tends to be the one where I, ca- I try to catch my mistakes, and then the third. By then, I've gotten a good sense of the language, and in a sort of a third draft, I um, I start to make it mine, and there's always there's like a break that happens as well where I, I um, stray from the text and do whatever I want. And usually it's then a process of like coming back, coming closer to the original again. I Every time before I send a translation into an editor, I have a panic that I'm sure everybody has, which is, oh my God, I could have done everything differently. And... Um, yeah, I've just come to accept that not as a time to stop because I guess more edits come with the editor, but like that's that's also like a, I don't know, a panic that comes um, when I've told myself to stop. I'm kind of similar in that I do like a very, very fast, very rough first draft. And I think, Rhonda, like you say, around the third one, it starts to be kind of half decent and then I really do a lot after that often you even like two and three where I'm not looking at the French much and then at the very end I kind of bring the French back but I think that's a really important part of it for me is the drafts where you're not looking at the French where you're really just trying to look at your own sentences and how they relate to each other and then uh, there's always room to fix it at the end. But I find if I don't do that, I kind of can get lost and take some wrong paths. Um, now I'll ask the second question, which was, um, how do each of you see translation and your work in it influence other areas of your life, be it in your writing, in your reading, in your corresponding, or as you move through the world in general? Um, are there any exchanges or transfers of knowledge and practice that you've experienced and would like to share? Well, I find that living in 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 Quebec, in Montreal, I translate from French to English. Um, and living here, it's kind of like I'm always working because any language I see, uh, you know, I kind of start to translate it in my mind. Um, so there's a need to turn that off sometimes because it becomes... Uh, a little bit automatic and sometimes a little bit oppressive. Um, but I think it's, it's uh, I, I, I started as a writer, uh, a commercial writer, and then I became a commercial translator, and then I moved on to literary translation. So at the early part of my career, I was doing a lot of writing, and now I do a lot of translating. But I found, uh, because I've been starting to write some of my own stuff recently, um, the translation uh, kept my writing developing through all the years, uh, <clears throat> despite the fact that I was working on someone else's work. So uh, I, I felt like at one point that maybe I had stepped away from writing, but in fact I haven't. I think my writing's matured just by, you know, um, crafting somebody else's work into English. Yeah, I feel really, I feel really similarly. I, I think that um, uh, I. S- I started as a writer, whether or not I was published is, I don't know, something I not to think about, I suppose. But um, I feel like, especially when I was working on my first novel, which, which took a very long time and started out as a nonfiction project, I feel like it was only through translation um, that I started to understand um, like how long a novel is, like what what a book is, that it actually ends, and um, 
what happens between chapters and in the spaces between lines and things. And I felt like it, um, that, oh my gosh, how am I ever going to finish my own book feeling went away uh, because of translation, which was really great. And I think there's a lot of like, um, movement back and forth, I think, between my own language and, and the language that I'm creating for the writers that I'm translating. And there's this like constant, constant flow between the two, which I find really exciting and sometimes unnerving. Um, where does the trend, where, like, where do I begin and end as a writer? Um, yeah, and this language bathing thing, like to just immerse myself in language to keep to keep a sense of like current usage in North America or the UK alive. Um, it's been really weird during the pandemic, I think, because I, I, I'm, I'm used to say, you know, sitting in places and just letting language wash over me, but I live in Germany and I translate from Swedish and my English was, I guess, half and half formed in the States and, and in the UK. And it's been kind of odd to mostly have podcasts and such media to rely on. I really miss bathing in language in a in a in a laundromat or a cafe or on the tube you know and i i think especially lately during the pandemic but even in generally it's such a solitary job that i find it's easy to start thinking about like the the translation experience and practices as like metaphors for everything. It's like, Oh, this is exactly what life is like. And sometimes you talk with other translator friends and you get, you kind of lose sight of the rest of the world and like (laughs) what normal people are worried about. But, uh, I think like you said, Saskia, the, and Rhonda being in between languages all the time. Um, it really does, change how I act and I, also I don't live it's been a long time since I lived in my native language in English so I think losing English becomes kind of a concern it's really hard to to keep up and I find often especially stuff like slang I'm kind of a few years back now <laughs> when I have characters I'm translating her my age I'm, I'm like okay good so they're gonna have the same slang I was using kind of 15 years ago. But slang's a really weird thing in translation, I think. I find it a really hard decision to make when to introduce newer slang. And I feel like I tend to use older, older slang in general. I've like tried to introduce, yeah, I tried to introduce some newer things and they, and they never quite sit right. And I'm, I'm wondering if it's the text that I'm translating, like if that text can't hold the slang that I'm trying, that I'm imagining might, I might want to put in there or like, I guess I'm waiting one day for like a text where I'm going to go, ah, this really requires like very contemporary, um, English slang. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a really rich and interesting, uh, corner of translation, I think. And one that I feel completely unresolved about and also quite insecure, I think. And I think it's a lot easier to go backwards too. When I have books now written by people who are kind of in their early twenties, I kind of feel like I should find someone younger than me to do it rather than thinking, okay, I can just like slide in there and uh, use today's slang. I think it's much easier to go back in time when you're translating and do stuff from a hundred years ago, because we have so many references we can use that are written, but it's very hard to write in, in kind of a real kind of street vernacular that's younger than us, I think. I'm sure some people can't, but it's something I I think about a lot. Yeah, I mean, I like how in hearing all three of you talk, I mean, I'm obviously asking these questions because I'm personally interested in in hearing more about process. And that's why I like that um, I get to hear through all of you today. I mean, what one thing that we're hearing from all of you is just like the overwhelming um, presence of either like shame or insecurity in like every every draft or everything. And I love that now I can kind of have the phrase in my head, arranging the furniture stolen from Saskia. Cause I find that, <laughs> I find that really, really useful. And the whole reason I wanted to ask about drafts is because on Pablo's site, you know, was um, 
the end of your site, it says more drafts is the sum total of my theory of translation. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just, I was really, really interested in hearing, hearing more um, about drafts from all of you. So, but I, I you do so feel, I do kind of feel that way just because I've never found anything else, any other tricks that were, you know, like some people have taught me new things like listening to it in text to speech. And there are other things you can do, but I haven't really found a substitute for just keeping at it and going through it. And we've heard that it. from all of you today. There's <laughs> yeah. a lot of drafts, yeah. Drafts and also if, if I can build in time to not think about the text, that always really mm -hmm. helps. Oh, yeah. Just put, putting it in the drawer is also a really good uh, quote unquote draft, I think. It, it mm -hmm. should be yeah. built into every contract that you get yeah. to put it aside for six <laughs> months because when you yeah. get it back, everything shows. Yeah. <laughs> and editors we can't forget our editors <laughs> indeed that was our show thanks to everyone who helped out this week my name is James Lindsay Andrew Kaufman was your producer Special thanks to Claire Foster from the mighty Type Books in Toronto for leading our translation segment. Thanks for listening. Episode two comes out in two weeks.